the impact of the war in the Ukraine has been felt across the globe in more ways than we could have imagined. While myself nor Daniel Cloud are definitely not geopolitical experts, we tackle the issue of the ripple effect felt across the gaming industry. Daniel is the CEO of Entropic, a COVID baby and a rising star of European esports clubs. While direct impact of war is known, senseless and pointless, there are other often unknown happenings behind the scenes. Today, we discuss exactly that. We talk about sanctions, visa issues, travel restrictions in a post-COVID war. Today might not be as simple as we'd like it to be. Before you got into esports, you were an investment banker for 15 years. How does an investment banker become the CEO of an esports club? Yeah, you're right. But, um, you know, it, it's a coincidence, actually. I used to play uh, Counter-Strike 1.6 at uh, quite a competitive level, mm-hmm. uh, at least on the, on the Czech and Slovak scene. You were like a pro player, right? Uh, well, it, it was... <laughs> With today's perspective, it's difficult to uh, call people from back then a pro players. But for that context, but for back then. But yeah, back then, back then you could you could say that yes. Yeah. My best friend is, uh, or one of my best friends is uh, is a headhunter. Okay. And uh, we know uh, each other from the CS days. We used to be uh, teammates. Okay. And he kind of knew I'm, I'm a, or one year ago almost I was ready for. Uh, for another challenge, and he somehow got in touch with uh, with the founder of Entropic. Mm-hmm. They discussed uh, some some uh, different stuff, but it was also mentioned that uh, that they were looking for somebody to to basically help running the company. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, here I am. Here you are. Back to esports after fifteen years. <laughs> so, what has been the biggest challenge for you as someone coming in from one world, which I mean, investment banking, it, it is what it is, right? It's super corporate. Well, that's how I assume it to be. And, uh, you know, all the kind of investment bankers that I've worked with, yeah, it's a super corporate environment to an esports environment, which is quite, maybe I, I'm going to use the word unregulated in the sense that I think that's a good word, right? Yeah, it's a nice word. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, like it's kind of like the wild, wild west a little yes. bit. Yes. I mean, you kind of you answered the question already. <laughs> I shouldn't do that, hey. <laughs> All right, say it in your own words. <laughs> no, I mean, I, this, this is exactly it. Uh, I came from a world uh, where everything was uh, super professional, where people, you know, were reliable, uh, dedicated. Uh, to, uh, to a wild, wild west, yeah, that was, that was a correct description. Esports is still at the beginning and mm-hmm. it's in many in many ways in many senses it's still kind of amateur we are all working hard to make it more professional mm-hmm. to make it more structured to make it uh, maybe more predictable in a way things are planned and happening yeah but there is still a long way to go uh, which means a lot of headaches a lot of surprises <laughs> uh, but but also i see it as an opportunity to actually shape the industry Okay. And what kind of changes have you brought to Entropic during your... Because you've been there for about six months, right? Yeah, something like that or nine, nine, nine to six. Yeah. Nine, nine to six. Nine, well, six to nine. What is it exactly, actually? Uh, I'm, I'm bad. I don't even know what month it is. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, I started, uh, I started cooperating with Entropic in May and I joined full-time in July. Okay. So it's almost a year, actually. Almost, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, what changes have you have you brought in so far? I think I, I brought fragments of the professional world that I come from. Meaning, I introduced uh, quite a few structures and processes. Mm-hmm. But still, I didn't want to kill the the productive, the creative environment that we have uh, at Entropic. So uh, I took it really, really slow. Maybe even slower than uh, was expected. But I feel mm-hmm. like uh, after. What is it? Let's call it nine months of full-time job. I, I feel like uh, we are in a really good shape, uh, prepared to seize, seize whatever opportunity is ahead of us. Okay. And how many people, including the teams, are a part of the Entropic? Uh, right now, Entropic is something between 100 and 120 people. Wow, that's a lot. 
it is a lot. It's more than I expected. <laughs> it's more than I expected when I, <laughs> when I joined. No, but we are we are growing uh, really quickly. We are we are hiring uh, all the time, and um, this figure includes all types of uh, employment. You know, it can it can be like uh, people that uh, work with us to to manage one of the smaller social networks that we use to full time mm-hmm. employees. It's it's uh, the whole range. Okay, and are you mainly growing in the number of teams that you have, or in the number of employees and let's say the, the back office, let's call it. It's both actually, mm-hmm. both at the same time. And I feel right now we should primarily be growing in terms of quality. I don't want uh, more volumes. You want to, to, to up the quality of the work rather than to grow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But even for the, for the gaming department, even for the teams that we have and that compete in our flags, in our, in our colors, we want to increase quality overall. Okay. Got it. And how did how did the the team and by this I actually mean the back office team react to the changes that you brought in? Mostly positively, mm-hmm. because it brought again maybe some stability or some predictability mm-hmm. for for part of the team. It also they 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 now better understand the purpose of what they are doing. Okay. Uh, and so I feel they are uh, much more motivated and engaged in the business. Okay. Was there anything that they resisted? Oh yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> but it, it, it's also partly my mistake because uh, I started really softly. Ah. I think I was the nicest guy at the beginning. You should have pushed them harder. Yeah, yeah. But I wanted to get to know the company, get to know the people before uh, I make any uh, more drastic changes. You wanted them to like you first, right? <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, for example, uh, during especially during COVID times, we had really flexible working environment. Uh, people could work wherever they wanted, from wherever they wanted, uh, to some extent. While now we are trying to uh, meet uh, every day, at least for for some time in the office, we found it much more efficient uh, because we can, you know, discuss ideas in real time. We can brainstorm. Mm-hmm. It avoids many conflicts that occurred uh, when we were simply texting or having uh, video calls. But you know, it's it's less flexibility for some people. You mentioned when we spoke a few days ago that, you know, the company is a COVID baby. Uh, that was a really kind of cool uh, term that, that you used because the company started, I think you mentioned exactly at the time that COVID hit or something like this. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, yeah, it, it's correct. Entropic was founded during the COVID times mm-hmm. or just before, which I feel positioned us quite well because we weren't used to anything at the beginning and so we quickly got used to the new to the new world to the new reality okay because you had no no other structures yeah no, no other way of operating yeah exactly and that that was the only way to operate in the chaos that was kind of the new reality the, the new world we're living in at the same time uh, the founders definitely had some expectations and uh, some of these, uh I wasn't with entropy back then but I I can imagine that some of these were difficult to realize uh, with all the restrictions. Yes. Uh, so it wasn't all good. But I feel maybe we had some advantage compared to some established uh, teams or organizers or whatever. Because you had no other way of operating, so you only had this one. Do you think that this contributed to the success of the club? No, 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 not necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily. <laughs> I think the founders were able to gather uh, a really dedicated and talented group of people to start with. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty confident that they would thrive in uh, in any condition. Okay, great answer. <laughs> Good <you>. one. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about the successes that you guys have had? Because I think that's that's there's been some cool shit. I'll try to make it as quick as possible because uh, there's a lot of successes actually. Mm-hmm. But our, our major success is uh, competing at the CSGO major in Stockholm. That's, that was definitely a game changer for us, uh, both esports wise and business wise. Mm-hmm. On the business front, I think, well, what I think is the major success is that we are actually the first uh, team in the world that got partnership with McDonald's. Mm-hmm. Even before FaZe got them, uh, we already had them. Nice. We teamed up with uh, McDonald's at the beginning. So they kind of had to trust our plans, our promises, because there was no history for us. Mm-hmm. And uh, in this regard, I think it's uh, quite outstanding. 
Okay. And at, at what point of the club's existence did this deal come through? W- were you part of this or was this before your time? It was before I inherited uh, this partnership. Okay. And what do you know about how it actually happened? Like, what do you think sold McDonald's on, on this? I think the way we present it, we want to do esports, which means professional. Mm-hmm. Uh, but professional doesn't mean, you know, like we come and we say, hey, hey, we will do this like these big guys that are already here. Mm-hmm. We actually, from from the beginning, wanted to do it much better. We felt like in esports, the bar is quite low. And uh, if you do your job properly, if you introduce some, some new ways of mostly managing teams, mm-hmm. you can achieve great success. When you say the bar in esports is low, what exactly do you mean? That that could be a controversial uh, yeah. statement you just made. <laughs> I just realized. <laughs> what I, what I meant is that uh, most most of the esports world is run by former players or by fans that turned esports professionals. But a lot of these people actually have no no experience from uh, from the. I would call it real business. Esports now is real business, but they have, you know, nothing uh, to bring to the game except for the love for esports. Right. And I just think it's not sufficient. And a lot of people realized, and you can, uh, when you scroll your, your uh, LinkedIn feed, you can see that that so many seasoned professionals join esports uh, teams, organizations. So do you think that there's a movement kind of happening where uh, these teams or these clubs or even esports organizations are seeing this issue and have decided, all right, we need to get some people maybe outside of the gaming world into into it. Absolutely. What differences do you think you brought to the table for McDonald's? Like what were the key factors, do you think? I think, uh, I can only think because I wasn't there back then, but we were presenting our way of doing esports really differently from anybody else. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were just, uh, they, they decided to enter esports and we were the natural partner for them because we treat our business partners really as partners. We are we are trying to make uh, every partnership a win-win deal. And uh, what is also important that in our deal, uh, during the first year, we already had quite strict KPIs. Okay, I was, I, I was going to ask about that. What, like what, what kind of KPIs or how does that work? All kinds of KPIs. Mm -hmm. There are actually many uh, from, uh, you know, delivering some figures on your social media. Uh, You can use various measurements for that Mm -hmm. to uh, organizing a tournament uh, to, you know, shooting certain type of content, uh, etc. There are actually many. And uh, and the important thing is that during the first year of our deal, we were able to, to deliver on these. Nice. As the deal got extended, increased, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Like we, we kind of spoke about this on Friday. Uh, and I said that, you know, McDonald's is, you know, uh, for me, a little controversial always to get into partnership with. Here in Poland, we had this deal uh, happen between one of the most kind of popular rappers at this time uh, who went into a deal with McDonald's, I think, kind of following in Travis Scott's footsteps in America, where there's like quite a lot of this. Was there any concerns about the fact that, you know, McDonald's is not super healthy and should should we really be promoting this? As far as I know, n- no, not really. Uh, mm-hmm. Because the, first of all, I think McDonald's is a love brand. Mm-hmm. That's true. For most people. For most people that I know, it's a love brand. I still have feelings about the Happy Meals. Yeah, of course. Everybody does. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um I don't think you can actually have any side thoughts when you are partnering with the love brand. It's exactly the brand that we want to okay. partner with. And uh, other than that, yeah, you probably shouldn't eat fries uh, twice a day. No. But everybody knows, and that's just fine. You know, it's all about finding uh, finding the balance. But yeah. uh, in terms of the values that McDonald's stands for, uh, in terms of uh, how they do stuff, uh, I think we are really aligned. And uh, we actually have a lot to learn from them. And they, okay. uh, and they teach us which is absolutely great. What can you? What else can you wish for? Yeah. Do you remember when the first McDonald's opened? I think back then maybe it was still Czechoslovakia, but uh, do you remember this? <laughs> Coincidentally, I know I know this exactly. So do I, in, here, in Poland. Last week, last week, they just celebrated 30 years in the Czech Republic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, again, they, they did it nicely because uh, instead of having a huge party, they actually... Uh, 
did did an activity that supported uh, victims of the war. Wow. Which is, you know, uh, again, they are doing a great job. But there is one important fact that I want to mention. Actually, at the first branch that they opened, uh, which is uh, in the center of Prague, mm-hmm. uh, we ran a FIFA tournament at that branch for them last year. That was one of the activations uh, that were part of our deal. And I thought that was like a really cool thing to do. Do, do you remember like when you were a kid, a guy going to that first McDonald's? Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> it was always um, a reward for something. Yeah. It was like a big deal. Yeah, yeah, we we used to go with my best friend and uh, with our moms uh, when you know when we behaved. <laughs> yeah, my dad my dad took me uh, to the very first like Warsaw, but it was like a huge opening. Like when you see the pictures, it's like this huge thing with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And that McDonald's is still there. I'm sure it's been renovated a million times since then, but it's it's still there. It's such a memory. So. From from very happy topics like happy meals, you did mention, uh, you know, that McDonald's was doing, uh, you know, an, an activation, or maybe not an activation, but the the, the thirty year celebration was in support of the victims of the war in the Ukraine. And this is definitely an, an interesting topic because we're you know we're hearing about it on the news all the time. Both of our countries, Poland and, and the Czech Republic, were you know we're super close to this conflict. So I think that a lot of people are, are feeling really impacted, and obviously we're seeing images of all kinds of images. And I'm not sure how it is for you guys, but we've had a huge influx of refugees coming in. It's the same here. I think we are the two countries that uh, support the most. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've got the Ukrainian consulate. I was pretty sure it was the embassy, but my friend told me that it's the consulate. And usually when I would walk past there, there would be like, you know, maybe five to 10 people waiting outside to to take care of anything. Now there's like hundreds. And you can definitely hear it because when you're walking around, you you hear uh, Ukrainian or or Russian, depending on on where they're from. So... uh, So what I want to talk to you about is how has, first of all, just generally, how has this impacted your business? Because I think that a lot of people aren't talking about this because it's like, oh, should we really be talking about how it's impacting business because there's some really serious things happening? But I do think that it's still an important aspect of what's happening. So how how is this war impacting on, on your club specifically? It has impacted our business in uh, in two ways. Uh, first of all, already before the conflict, some of the partners didn't prefer to be associated with uh, shooters, with shooting games. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, this uh, this conflict has increased this trend. So partners that, that were like, you know, uh, I'm not sure if, if I want to be like uh, on your Counter-Strike jersey, they are now like, you know, <laughs> let's not do this now. Let's maybe wait. Uh, let's see how, how everything goes. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of the partners that weren't concerned at all before uh, are now already thinking about uh, how they want to position themselves. Right. So that was the first thing about shooting games. Yeah. Okay. And out of your 10 teams, because I think you you have 10 teams, uh, how many of them are shooting teams? Six at the moment, which is quite a lot. That's so funny. I knew we were going to say six. I had no idea, but in my head, I just went six. And the other four, what do they play? The other four is uh, is uh, FIFA, League of Legends, uh, Wild Rift, which is League of Legends on mobile, and uh, we have a racing racing team. So those are pretty pretty safe for now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, out of the six shooting games, one of them is uh, Valorant, mm-hmm. which uh, some partners don't regard a violent shooter because it's it's like a you know comics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it looks like a comic game, yeah. But some of these still, uh, you know, do because at the end of the day, when you are able to uh, shoot well, you succeed. Right. So, yeah, uh, we have, let's say, half of our half of our teams partially affected. It didn't translate to money terms. Okay. I hope it won't. Mm-hmm. But it affects uh, heavily the way we promote our business and we promote our partners. Okay, so so for example, you've had to I don't know remove or at least change the jerseys that they're wearing when they're playing right now. 
or have they stopped, for example, some marketing activities, just paused in the meantime? All, all of this stuff, yeah. Some, something got delayed, something had to be adjusted. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had to adjust some graphics. We had to adjust uh, with, our, with some of our players. When you say graphics, what do you mean? Like, for example, how we announce upcoming matches, how we announce results, uh, etc. Okay, because the partner logos can be there or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. or something like this. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. I, I didn't even think of that. You know, this is this is some of the things that you you don't really think about how how such a situation can even impact these tiny details, like a logo on a jersey. I just hope um, all of this is temporary because uh, we are consistently trying to explain to our partners that even shooting games are more about tactic tactics. It's like a chess game. If you do the right mm-hmm. moves at the right time, it's actually not about uh, the fastest shooters. It's about the brightest minds. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, but it's a long way. It's a long way to go. And it's also so much about community, you know, yeah. and the, the gaming community right. from, from my experience in, in, my, in my life has been a very inclusive and been a community that's generally full of kind of love and affinity and acceptance. And, and obviously there's this, you know, sometimes problems everywhere, but that's generally been my experience as well. Um, mine as well. Mine as well. And uh, I think everybody saw, for example, simple speech uh, at the major. Oh, was it? Was it the major? No, no, it was one of the recent events. I am, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I am Katowice. Simple speech uh, was so uniting, so strong. Uh, and I feel it just, it, it's a symbol of how a vast majority of the community thinks right now. Okay. So you mentioned that there's two ways it's impacting your business. The first one is obviously the partners are a little bit concerned about the shooting games. What's the second part? Well, the second part is, uh, for those that don't know, we have a Counter-Strike team uh, that has four Russians and one Kazakh uh, in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the current conflict brought a lot of uh, mostly mostly logistic problems to us. Uh, but also we were trying to seal deals uh, with Russian companies, specifically supporting this team. Right. And that that, that had to be put on hold right now. Uh, we hope we will be able to get back to the negotiation table one day, but uh, simply now it's not, it's not possible at all. Okay. And I mean, I could answer this question for myself, but I would like to hear it. Why is it impossible exactly? Because in theory, in theory, you could talk to these people. I guess. I mean, um, actually, maybe not because so many, so many ways of communicating are down for them, uh, which is interesting. But okay, in theory, if you really, really wanted, you could talk to them with the hope that in the future, you know, you can work out the deal and it, it would happen. So why is it, why, why would it be on hold? I think there is so much uncertainty right now mm-hmm. around everything. You know, will it be possible to actually send money both ways right. between the EU and Russia? Will you be able to promote uh, your partners on social media? Because right now, maybe it's not possible. Maybe mm-hmm. it's possible on some of the social media. Uh, everybody has a different approach and different restrictions. There are you know, reputational issues. There might be some sanctions issues going forward. Nobody knows what's going to happen and what is going to happen. And uh, so I think the best approach right now is actually to wait. Right. And do you or did you have any... Russian partners already? No, no, not already, no. but uh, okay. we have, we, we've been in quite advanced negotiations with a few. Ouch. Okay. So you've had to put that on hold. Okay. So besides that also being an impact, what's the, because I understand if I remember correctly, the four Russian players generally lived in Russia. Yes. Okay. And so what is the, what has the impact been for them? From the simplest things like, uh, you know, getting to Europe. Uh, mm-hmm. Now we, there are no direct flights from Moscow to, to the EU, uh, as far as I know. So how did they? How did they have to fly? Through Middle East, or there is the, more than one route. Route, but um, it's like maybe through Doha or Doha, yeah, like a big yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, Do- Doha. Or, or, so first, like five hours to Doha, and then f- oh my god, yeah, or five through, hours to Turkey, Europe. and maybe there are some other ways. But for example, I think it's still possible to go through Serbia. Anyway, it's, it's very complicated. It's mm-hmm. much more expensive. Right. And uh, there is uncertainty about how visa will work in the future. Okay. Because, uh, you know, 
our players luckily have valid visa right now. But come next renewal, what's going to happen? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. And I spoke to... Oh, I don't... Oh, I'm, I'm really bad at remembering with the podcast who I speak to about what sometimes. But I did have a guest on who talked about making esports like an official sport in the country so that the players could get, you know, player visas. Is there any country right now where this is a thing? Do you know? There definitely is. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't have the list uh, in my mind. I can't tell you. But uh, I've noticed uh, that uh, actually there are more, more countries in Europe that already accepted esports as a regular sport. Mm -hmm. I know uh, people are working on it in the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. uh, but it hasn't happened yet. But anyway, uh, tournament organizers have been very helpful in this regard, and they always, uh, you know, gave us good uh, invitation letters and good good reasons to come to the country of the tournament. And so I, I, I'm not sure if that would like help dramatically mm -hmm. in this situation. Yeah, yeah. If esports were a sport, I feel like. Uh, until now, and uh, I'm I'm hopeful that going forward, every problem has a solution. Yeah, it's just become more complicated. That's it. So the, the players have they been able to get out of Russia to to play in a tournament recently? Yeah, yeah. They they traveled to Germany to Düsseldorf uh, to play at uh, EPL 15 ESL Pro League. Mm -hmm. From there, they traveled to Prague. They are right now. Uh, with us in Prague, practicing, and uh, they have uh, a few tournaments uh, in the EU ahead of them. So it still is possible. People can travel uh, mm -hmm. to Russia and uh, outside of Russia. So far, it's just been, you know, uh, logistic complications. And uh, I hope it will stay that way. And uh, actually, it will, you know, there will be some peaceful solutions soon and uh, things will ease. Yeah, well, we all hope that this, this ends as soon as possible. And are they planning to stay in Prague for now? There's only a certain time that they can stay in the EU based on their visas. So we are we are carefully planning around that. Mm -hmm. But no, they are supposed to travel to travel, I think, to Portugal for a tournament. That's not like 100% confirmed, but we expect that. Uh, then they are going back to Germany for playoffs of the of the ESL Pro League. Mm -hmm. Then there is uh, an important tournament in Romania, and uh, then hopefully in Belgium. So, uh, <laughs> so fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, until end of May we have pretty. A pretty busy schedule. Yeah. And there would have also been some kind of issue with money, I guess. Like, you know, players get paid and yeah. these guys can't really get paid right now. Well, for now, it is possible to send money to Russia. Okay. But it's difficult for uh, for the Russian people to actually use this money. Wow. But again, again, it's, it's a logistics issue that has a solution. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just... And I, I and I fully understand the reasons why this is happening. Uh, it's just so much so much work for you, or for yeah. us. Yeah. And, uh, but it all it all kind of makes sense. Right, right. And how have the players themselves been impacted? Like, how are they feeling? Like, what's the vibe? They are really worried for too many reasons. Mm -hmm. First of all, they are part of of a young interconnected community. Mm -hmm. So they they have friends. They have maybe even some relatives in Ukraine. Right. Uh, and their own life in uh, Russia has also become uh, more complicated. So uh, they are they are really stressed because they don't exactly know what will happen. Mm -hmm. And they care about other people, naturally. Right. Also from a professional point of view, they are worried if they will be allowed to compete because they are Russians, uh, if, if the tournament yeah. organizers will, will let them play if we will keep them or we will say, you know, we don't want to have anything to do with Russians, et cetera, et cetera. So right. there's a lot of work on the mental front uh, with them as well. And uh, yeah, this is the difficult part, actually. Right. This is not a problem that has like a step-by-step -step solution. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing you can do except take the next step and then the next step and see what happens. Yeah. Wow. Uh, because like, to make it clear to the people listening, like the team is officially like a Czech team. Do you guys like officially because the business is, is in the Czech Republic, it's a Czech team? Yeah, that's, that's our, a huge advantage actually because, you know, we are still invited to all the tournaments. Uh, we are able to compete because uh, we are a Czech team with uh, Czech shareholders mm -hmm. uh, based in Prague. We have no ties to, to uh, Russian sponsors, the Russian government. And uh, yeah, so in this regard, they are actually, our Russian players are, are signed to the right organization. 
because some, some of their friends that are part of, of Russian-based teams, mm-hmm. they are in much more trouble. Right, yeah. What, do you know much about what's happening with... Because there's some really big Russian uh, clubs that have been impacted by this as well. What, can you talk a little bit about that? From, from what I know, that uh, s- some of the tournament organizers, for example, cancelled uh, Russian or CIS qualifiers for certain tournaments, uh, meaning mm-hmm. that uh, you know, the Russian teams lost the opportunity to compete on some of the big stages. And uh, some, some of the organizers basically let the players play if they are not playing for the Russian uh, orgs, meaning they have to change their name and they cannot promote their sponsors, etc. It, it okay. happened uh, right now in Germany at the tournament where two of the top, top Russian organizations let their players play under one they one are called uh, outsiders and the other team is called players. Right. Okay. Yeah, well, if, if this situation uh, persists, it will, of course, have a huge impact because uh, they wouldn't be able to promote their partners. Mm-hmm. Maybe they would even be forced to let their rosters go. I don't know. I don't really know what are their plans, but I know for sure. I know for a fact that it is a big deal for these teams. Uh, do you think that any of the teams, the clubs, would be maybe even forced to sell their players in the same way that, that players are sold and traded in, let, let's say, football do you think this is something that could happen? There are currently rumors that uh, Gambit, one of the Russian teams, uh, is selling their roster. Wow. It's not confirmed, but it kind of would make sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it would make sense at this point. And they are they are just uh, just so that you know they are like number two or number three team in the, in the world right now. So uh, it's it's huge for the scene. Right. Wow. Yeah. The the impact. It's. You know, I'm I'm talking a lot to people about this because I'm always fascinated about what's happening in the world and the other impacts that the, the impacts that you know are not big enough to talk about on the news because you know it's there's bigger obviously issues <laughs> uh, you know um, than than talking about these kind of smaller impacts, but they're still felt and they're still quite interesting to me. You know, so so thanks for telling me all that. <laughs> that was that's really fascinating to me. I, I would like to end on a more positive positive note to make it into you know a positive sandwich. Yeah, let's let's do this, please. Let's do this, please. So, uh, what? Tell me a little bit about what you've got planned for the future of the club. We have what huge do you want plans. to do? Yeah, your <laughs> future plans. What do you want to do? We have huge plans, and I only have I only have like ten minutes. Our strategy is is uh, twofold. Mm-hmm. We need to maintain a competitive reputation and even mm-hmm. increase it, which means that we need to have the best teams possible and uh, win as many matches or as many tournaments as possible. Yeah, it's obvious, and uh, I would say similar for everybody in the in the industry. Right, and we, we are working hard on that. For example, we just dominated uh, the Czech League of Legends scene. We won uh, the local league. We are undisputed champs. And uh, we are going to fight for our spot in Europe. Okay. Uh, we are in a playing stage of uh, a tournament called EU Masters, mm-hmm. where we will compete against uh, some of the best teams from Europe. So our plan is to establish ourselves uh, as a European League of Legends uh, player. Okay. With regards to, to other teams we have, Ten teams might be a lot, but but you know sometimes there is an opportunity that you simply can't say no to. Mm-hmm. So it is possible that we will we will onboard uh, more teams, but it's more probable that we will stay around number ten or maybe go uh, a bit lower. Let's see. We we just invited a women's team in CS:GO. Oh yeah, that's right, a Polish team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. five Polish girls. It's a huge thing for me, again, uh, coming from a corporation where diversity was one of the key topics. Uh, yeah. I feel it's coming to esports as well. Uh, I think it's a good thing. And uh, we are excited uh, to see where it takes us. Wow. But we are, we are really happy to have this, uh, this uh, female team. Yeah, yeah. That breaks a lot of stereotypes, especially because yes. well, they're playing CSGO, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. And that takes me actually to, to our, uh, let's say... Um, marketing or, or business strategy. Mm-hmm. We basically want to continue uh, 
breaking boundaries between uh, like niche esports and and mainstream. Mm-hmm. There's a lot lot of work to do in this regard in the Czech Republic. Our goal is, uh, you know, for for everybody to associate entropic with esports or esports with entropic. Mm-hmm. We are also trying to uh, break boundaries or maybe connect our our main audience, which is uh, Generation Z, with the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we feel like uh, we are the right platform because they live they live their life uh, both online and offline, and they make no difference. Mm-hmm. And we are really good and really present online, mm-hmm. and we uh, we need to go more offline with them. Okay, more offline with them. Yeah. Okay, so events, t- tournaments, anything else? It could be anything. It could be various activations. We have a group of, group of uh, associated influencers. Uh, they are called friends and fellas. And uh, our ambition is not to be only a sports brand. We want to be a lifestyle brand. We want uh, Entropic to be widely recognized. So. Uh, it can be really, really anything. Uh, we are trying to come up with original ideas, with creative ideas. It seems COVID will let us do more stuff now. <laughs> and yeah, so these are our, these are our plans uh, in a nutshell. Let's finish up with my favorite question that I ask everybody at the end. What advice would you give to your younger self? Ha. Huh. <laughs> Okay, I'm. I'm actually quite happy where I am. I don't. I don't mm-hmm. think uh, I need it. Well, you always need an advice, but I don't think I would want to change anything. It's not about that for me. Like because, for example, I'm super happy where I am as well. But if I had to give advice to my younger self, I would say, chill the fuck out. Don't stress so much about things. You know, that would be my advice because I think that stress and worry lessened maybe my enjoyment of the past. You know what I mean? That's kind of like that. It's not about what you would change, but if you had young Dan in front of you, you know, from some moment in his life where maybe things were difficult or whatever, what would you say to him? Okay, maybe one thing, maybe Mm -hmm. one thing. Time will heal everything. Time will heal everything. That's a good one. Yeah, I agree with this. Good. Good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, too. I'm just curious when I listen to this, uh, <laughs> what I actually said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, like I have a terrible, terrible memory uh, and uh, I often don't remember and I communicate with my friends often by recording myself and they'll answer and I'll be like I will have to listen to myself again to remember what I said so this is kind of the problem with talking uh anyway thank you so much for today thank you so much for all your insights and I wish you uh, I know that I don't even have to wish you all the uh, all the success in the world because I I feel like uh, you're gonna achieve everything that, that you set out to do. Oh, but there's never never enough of uh, good wishes. So thank you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Have a good one. <laughs> you too.